And of course, the discovery of oil in the North Sea is a bonanza which enabled. Saudi Arabia is not a democratic country. It's not a capitalist country. But it's a very rich country right now. That's Why? I, I agree because with it's that. found yes. oil. That's why you went back to 1960. I went back to 1960. If you take it from 1960 on, the fact of the matter is that the level of living in the United States the level of output in the United States is distinctly higher than it is in uh, Norway, has been all along. It is always very much easier for people to imitate than to in innovate. It was much easier for Japan, for example, to have a much more rapid rate of growth in its early years because it started so far behind. A country which starts way behind the leading countries can have a more rapid rate of growth. You have to look at two things, not only the rate of growth, but the level of living. Now, well, if, if you, you take, take Norway, Norway for that, Norway has an extremely high level yes, of living. Well, what was the standard in 1960? When, at the start of the this point of discussion, what, where did the United States uh, have to go from in 1960 and where did Norway have to go from in 1960? That's Isn't true. That it was point? higher at the time, but... Uh, I mean, it's still higher today. Uh, it depends on years. Like if we take 1980, Norway was higher. GNP it depends on exchange capital. rates. Well, I mean, it these are the standard that the measures. We, we, we apply these measures yes, to all I the understand. countries in all the years, I so understand. we can draw the conclusions yeah. both ways. Yeah. And this actually proves the point that Norway has been about. But uh, I just mentioned Norway to have one example. I could have mentioned other countries. Yeah. Sweden has a better record in many senses as well. It does. Uh, uh, it does. Average levels of living and, and, and economic growth rates even slightly better. That's not, not a great well, let's deal look at the facts. difference. Well, let's look at the facts. At the moment, as you quite rightly say, the average level of government spending in the United States is about, it's much too high in my opinion, it's about close to 35% of the GNP, over 40% of the national income. On the average in the continent of Europe, it's 50%. In the past 20 years, there have been 20 million new jobs created in the United States. Total employment has gone up by 20 million. The number of people employed on the continent of Europe today is lower than it was 20 year, 15 years ago. In the past 18 months, there have been 6 million new jobs created in the United States. On the continent of Europe, there have been zero new jobs. Unemployment today is as high as it was then or higher. So that it is pretty clear that what happened is if a country, you see, you have to ask which is a horse and which is a carriage. A wealthy country, a country that does well and performs very effectively, can afford a larger government than a country that does poorly. But as the size of the government increases, it becomes a handicap and a hindrance. And the question remains whether if Norway permits the size of its government to continue to rise, it will or will not, uh, be a uh, be a success. I think it will not. I, I I just want to make the point that I'm not saying that a big government is something we should ask for. I believe in uh, it would be ideal to have a small government. But my point is that the empirical facts actually go against your theory I on this believe, issue. No, excuse well, me. you can't deny we it because we have to look at all uh, the empirical facts. Take a case. Well, take. Let me give you a counter example. Here's Japan. In the 1960s. Japanese government spending as a fraction of income was roughly half of the United States. Its rate of growth was 10% a year. In the past five years, Japanese government spending has been rising rapidly relative to national income, and it's now as large as it is in the United States. And the rate of economic growth in Japan now is about 2%. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but Japan is also a bad but, case yeah. for you because uh, one of the things you, you have against government intervention, government regulation, uh, is that it has the same negative effects. And uh, Japan has a small uh, public sector in the sense of taxation, uh, relatively Not small. Not any longer. Uh, well, Not relatively any longer. small. But as, as regards regulation, the, the, the Japanese economy is a much more regulated economy than the United States one, but still they've done much better. Excuse a lot me? Of the, a lot of the investment uh, which um, uh, is, is, uh, goes into Japanese industry and research and development is channeled through public funds. I think that's been uh, greatly misunderstood and misconceived. MITI, mm -hmm. the Ministry of Industry and Trade, makes great claims. If you look at the success stories in Japan, none of them have been through government. 
Oh, have Sony was a private entrepreneur who did not get any government encouragement whatsoever. He built up Sony. Honda, I'm sure some of you drive Honda cars. Honda was not a government program. It did not get any government support. It has been a <coughs> great success. But what about the Mitsubishi Corporation? The, the Mitsubishi Enterprise was a major enterprise before the government entered in. If you take the Mitsubishi Enterprises, the steel works mm -hmm. did get government assistance. They are in great troubles now because there's a great overcapacity of steel around the world. The most prominent Japanese successes have been the ones where they've really made a dent, have been in electronics, television, automobiles. In all of those cases, it's been by individual entrepreneurs without, or in some cases against, the desires of meeting. Mm -hmm. Japan well, is a fascinating case. I've spent a lot of time in no. Japan. And the one thing I learned about Japan is any statement you can make about Japan which is true has an opposite statement which is equally true. If you say that the government plays a large role in business in Japan, you're right. If you say business plays a large role in government, you're right. If you say there's a large element of monopoly in Japan, you're right. If you say there's a large element of competition in Japan, you're right. For example, you know that Japan is almost the only country in the world that I know of where there are private highways conducted for profit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the railroads well, in Japan are part government, part private. Yes. Well, right, Professor, I think mixture. Mr. Grimson well, wants, to, wants from, to make uh, a point. This is a very from. interesting discussion because I think it illustrates uh, very well the method methodology which you usually imply. Did you say methodology or mythology? No, well, I could have said mythology because <laughs> part of it is I feel it that. Because as you said yourself uh, before, uh, you draw a distinction between your scientific work, which some other scientists have been criticizing very heavily, although you have wanted to downplay that criticism in this discussion. And then there is another area of your work, which is sort of political theory, in which you participate in a general political debate, trying to advocate your ideas, not on a scientific basis, but on a general basis of competition between ideas. Uh, but uh, there are a few countries where the governments have uh, adhered to your recommendations and where one has uh, a real-life situation. And uh, you said that the press conference here uh, yesterday that uh, in the first years in Chile, uh, the government followed your recommendation and it got excellent results. And to many people who have heard of you as an advocate of freedom, uh, it is a surprising paradox that a country where you have a military dictatorship, where a lot of people, th even thousands of people, were imprisoned for their views and some killed where human rights were almost completely abolished, where political parties were banned and there was no freedom of information or the press or so on, that in a such a country of this nature, your theories can be a success. Well, how do you explain the fact that in a country like China, which satisfies every one of your descriptions, mm. those particular scientific theories have also been a success. Well, I think that because there's a, some great similarity between some of the political right. system of well, China and some of the... Well, how do you explain the, the fact that in a country like Japan, yes. which it does not correspond well, well, to your description, well, the same theories well, I can have understand also been why a you success. Want to, I can understand why you want to avoid to talk a bit about Chile. But I'm let's, glad to talk yeah, about let's, Chile. Let's I'm not trying to yeah, avoid it well, at yeah, all. But, but let's talk about it in, in concrete terms. Of course, yeah, be us, glad let, to. Let us talk about it how it is. That, uh, Let's uh, talk about yeah, Chile in concrete terms. Yeah. Let's talk about the fact that my can participation I, I in Chile... Question? Can I, can I explain question? first what my participation well, in yeah, Chile was? Because yes. it seems to me that's highly relevant to this discussion. Oh. My participation in Chile has two parts. It has to do with the fact that the University of Chicago had a contract with the Catholic University of Chile before the period we're talking about, in which they sent students to Chicago to be trained, we sent people down there to help them in providing their education. And as a result, we trained at the University of Chicago many highly skilled economists yeah. who well, played an important well, I, I part know all that. I in know economic all that. policy. Yeah. In I the know second all that. place, in 1975, I spent exactly seven days in Chile giving a series of lectures. Mm. You will be interested to know that one of those lectures was entitled The Fragility.